Hello, my name is Mary Christina Wood. I'm a professor at University of Oregon School of Law, where I teach federal Indian law. And my name is John Michael Pardasati, and I'm a third year law student at the University of Oregon, uh, specializing in federal Indian law. It's our pleasure to present today a three-part video containing a short course on federal Indian law. This course will be divided into three parts. The first part will discuss the history and major principles of federal Indian law and policy. In the second part, we'll discuss native culture, traditional harvest, and talk about modern threats and opportunities. In part three, we'll talk about fulfilling the federal trust relationship particularly as it pertains to federal agencies. Let's begin part one, which concerns the history and major principles of federal Indian law and policy. We'll first take a quick glance at the modern picture. Indian country is occupied by numerous tribes diverse in their geographic location, cultural background, and history. At present, there are over 562 federally recognized tribes and at least 169 more tribes lacking federal recognition. There are approximately 300 federally administered Indian reservations, most located in the West, and on this slide you see the Indian reservations in the three states containing the Pacific Northwest. The federal Indian reservations across the United States total about 55 million acres. Roughly half of the American Indian population lives on or near reservations, while the other half lives primarily in urban areas. Reservations play a vital role in serving as the homelands and cultural enclaves for tribal people and in producing the resources needed by tribal communities. Professor Charles Wilkinson has described reservations as islands of Indianness within the larger society because these are places of culture, tradition, and values. Well, next, we will examine the medieval origins of federal Indian law. We're going back to the very beginning of the principles that continue to shape this area of law today. The theory used to disempower Aboriginal peoples and displace them from their lands actually derives from legal theory from several centuries ago, which manifested in the Crusades between the 11th and 13th centuries. We'll see in just a moment how this legal theory threaded itself through U.S. law. But first, the origins were in the Catholic Church, which of course was the dominant legal institution during the medieval times. The leader of the church was the Pope, and he was recognized as the, quote, divinely designated shepherd of Christ's universal flock, vested with the supreme spiritual jurisdiction over the souls of all humankind. Well, several European nations during this time were engaged in the business of conquest, and these included England, Spain, France, and Portugal. The discovery doctrine was the prevailing legal rule that justified this conquest, and it came from the Catholic Church. Basically, it said that whatever European nation discovered the land first had the sole right of dominion over that land and the right to deal with the indigenous people that lived on the land. So European monarchs essentially justified their conquest of Aboriginal peoples through this reference to Catholic law and particularly the discovery doctrine. It was assumed that infidels and non-Christians could not govern themselves lawfully because only a ruler who believed in the true Christian God and who received his power directly from the Pope in Rome had legitimate power. In sum, the Discovery Doctrine held that Native peoples didn't have full title to their land and that Christian nations had a right and power over lands that they did not inhabit. The legal do documents justifying this position were a series of papal bulls issued by the Pope. You have decided to subdue the said mainlands and islands and their natives and inhabitants with God's grace and to bring them to the Catholic faith, Pope Alexander. You have a direction to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans and other enemies of Christ. 1452 Papal Bull issued by Pope Nicholas V. Well, now we have to leap forward to explore the origins of the U.S. dealing with Indians. And of course, those derived really from the England colonial dealings with tribes.
In pre-colonial times, there was much trade between the French and the English and the Indians, particularly along in the Mississippi and in the Louisiana area. And at this time, of course, the European settlers were very much dependent on the good graces of Indian people because this was a hostile environment and the Europeans were greatly outnumbered. There is evidence that the early colonies dealt with tribes as nations. When the new nation of the United States came into being and it was time to write the Constitution, the United States was still vulnerable. And you find in the Constitution really only one clause directly pointing to the relationship with Indian nations. The clause is the Indian Commerce Clause and it states, Congress shall regulate commerce with the Indian tribes. And other than this, federal Indian law was really just a blank slate. Well, against this blank slate, the United States Supreme Court created a full body of federal Indian law. And one particular justice, Justice Marshall, really played the major role in designing the framework of federal Indian law that still endures today. In a trilogy of cases, Justice Marshall set forth the major principles that outline the field. The cases are Johnson v. McIntosh, Cherokee Nation v. Georgia, and Worcester v. Georgia. Let's proceed on to Johnson v. McIntosh. Johnson v. McIntosh was a case that really involved a, a title question. Who had title over all of this Aboriginal land that the tribes held within what we now call the United States? The facts of Johnson did not actually involve tribes per se. It involved a, a disputed claim to ownership of Indian land. Here's what had happened, the facts that gave rise to the case. There were two competing land claims of non-Indians. These competing claims arose because the tribes in question transferred the same land first to private parties and then to the federal government. So there were two different claimants on the same land. Prior to the Revolutionary War, land speculators had purchased lands from the Illinois and Piankashaw nations under two grants made by tribal chiefs, one in 1773 and the other in 1775. The plaintiff in the case, Johnson, was a successor to the purchasers. In other words, the tribe sold to certain people, those people sold to Johnson. So Johnson had one claim on the land. After the Revolutionary War, the tribes conveyed the very same land to the United States through a treaty executed in 1795, and the United States sold the land to McIntosh in 1818. Johnson challenged the validity of that sale. So it was a dispute between Johnson and McIntosh. The issue in the case was which land grant was valid. The earlier ones to individual speculators, that is Johnson's predecessors, or the latter one to the federal government. Certainly a traditional property law approach would favor the prior grants, but the court found those prior grants absolutely invalid. Justice Marshall held that the prior grants were invalid by creating basically a new rule of property that applies to just federal Indian tribes. The court ruled that the European discovery principle that we just spoke about gave rise to European sovereign property rights that overlaid the existing aboriginal title. In other words, the tribes did not have full title to convey when they conveyed the land to Johnson's predecessor. Only when the tribal title was merged with federal title did it become complete. Therefore, the latter grants which represented that merging of tribal title and federal title were the valid ones. On the discovery of this immense continent, the great nations of Europe were eager to appropriate to themselves so much of it as they could respectively acquire. Its vast extent offered an ample field to the ambition and enterprise of all, and the character and religion of its inhabitants afforded an apology for considering them as a people over whom the superior genius of Europe might claim ascendancy. The potentates of the old world found no difficulty in convincing themselves that they made ample compensation to the inhabitants of the new by bestowing on them civilization and Christianity in exchange for unlimited independence. But as they were all in pursuit of nearly the same object, it was necessary to establish a principle that discovery gave title to the government by whose subjects 
or by whose authority it was made against all other European governments, which title might be cons consummated by possession. The exclusion of all other Europeans necessarily gave to the nation, making the discovery the sole right of, of acquiring the soil from which the natives, from the natives, and establishing settlements upon it. It was a right with which no Europeans could interfere. It was a right which all asserted for themselves and to the assertion of which, by others, all assented. Well, those were the words of Justice Marshall in Johnson v. McIntosh, and these words issued by the Supreme Court still hold the force of law today. But Justice Marshall was a bit uncomfortable with some of these assertions, and he also wrote in his opinion some qualifiers. However extravagant the pretension of converting the discovery of an inhabited country into conquest may appear, if the principle has been asserted in the first instance and afterwards sustained, if a country has been acquired and held under it, if the property of the great mass of the community originates in it, it becomes the law of the land and cannot be questioned. So too, with respect to the concomitant principle that the Indian inhabitants are to be considered merely as occupants, to be protected, indeed, while in peace, in the possession of their lands, but to be deemed incapable of transferring the absolute title to others. However this restriction may be opposed to natural right and to the usages of civilized nations, yet, if it be indispensable to that system under which the country has been settled and be adapted to the actual condition of the two people, it may perhaps be supported by reason and certainly cannot be rejected by courts of justice. From this opinion, Johnson v. McIntosh, we derive four major principles of federal Indian title. First, the tribes do have the right of occupancy on their aboriginal lands. This is an actual property right. But second, the federal government, as a government derived from a Christian nation, has the right of discovery across these lands. This right is, in effect, inherited through England, which was recognized as a Christian nation by the Pope of the Catholic Church. Third, tribes' property rights are inalienable. In other words, they can transfer land only with the permission of the federal government. If they transfer land without this permission, the grant is void. And fourth, where tribes cede land to the federal government, that is, grant the land to the federal government, the title becomes complete because we've merged Aboriginal title with the federal right of discovery. And when that merging occurs, there is actual complete title that the federal government can then sell or grant to others. Well, this is a bit troublesome, of course, because the basis of federal Indian title does rest on a Christian distinction that has never been fleshed out in the framework of the constitutional principles. Associated with the Indian title was also a plenary power doctrine that came out in this case, Johnson v. McIntosh. Marshall spoke of the status of tribes versus the federal government in these terms. In the establishment of these relations, the rights of the original inhabitants were, in no instance, entirely disregarded but were necessarily, to a considerable extent, impaired. They were admitted to be the rightful occupants of the soil, with a legal as well as just claim to retain possession of it and to use it according to their own discretion. But their rights to complete sovereignty as independent nations were necessarily diminished, and their power to dispose of the soil at their own will, to whomsoever they pleased, was denied by the original fundamental principle that discovery gave exclusive title to those who made it. This plenary power doctrine, in other words, that f the federal government has full power over the Indian nations, is now a legal doctrine firmly embedded in Indian law, and it originates on fairly shaky foundation in Johnson. Nowhere is it found in the Constitution. Not surprisingly, it has been criticized by scholars. Professor Robert Williams, in particular, has written, Basically, denial of fundamental human rights based on differences in religion that had driven conquest and genocide for 1,000 years was, uplift, was uplifted into U.S. law and given sanction, 
ensuring that future acts of genocide would proceed on a rationalized legal basis. The second case in the trilogy of three that Marshall authored is called Cherokee Nation versus State of Georgia. And in that case, the Cherokee Nation, which had once had Aboriginal lands spanning five states east of the Mississippi, had its lands reduced by treaty to a territory that existed primarily within the state of Georgia. Well, when gold was discovered on these remaining lands, the state of Georgia sought to oust the Cherokee Nation. Even though the Cherokee Nation had a treaty guaranteed right to the land executed by the federal government called the Treaty of Hopewell, Georgia claimed the Cherokee law was null and void, and it passed laws distributing the Cherokee land among all the counties of Georgia. The tribe sued in, in the United States Supreme Court to ask the court to say that the laws of Georgia had no effect. The case was brought under the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. And that is a little bit complicated, but basically it says only a state or fa foreign nation can sue in that court under original jurisdiction. So the question came down to, is the Cherokee Nation a foreign nation? That was a question of first impression that Justice Marshall had the occasion to address. Marshall held that the Cherokee Nation was a domestic dependent nation, that its relationship to the United States was similar to that of a guardian to its ward. Though the Indians are acknowledged to have an unquestionable and heretofore unquestioned right to the lands they occupy, they may be denominated domestic dependent nations. They are in a state of pupillage. Their relation to the United States resembles that of a ward to his guardian. Well, out of this case came two primary principles. Number one, the federal Indian tribes do have sovereignty. Their sovereignty is somewhat diminished in the respect that they are not considered foreign nations, but nevertheless, they are nations, domestic dependent nations. The second principle that comes from this case is that of the trust responsibility. The federal trust responsibility was expressed by Marshall in these terms. The relation of the tribes to the United States resembles that of a ward to his guardian. The trust responsibility means that the federal government must protect the lands and resources and interests of federal Indian tribes. It's a very unique relationship that no other body on, in the United States has with respect to the federal government. All tribes stand in this federal trust relationship. Still, the Cherokee Nation left the Supreme Court without a remedy because there was no jurisdiction. Having held it was not a foreign nation, the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court could not obtain. In a follow-up case called Worcester v. Georgia, which is the third of the trilogy, Justice Marshall found that there was jurisdiction because a missionary had actually brought the suit, and so a missionary was the plaintiff in, in and uh, that, triggered the original, that triggered a different part of the jurisdiction of the United States. But the question was still the same, and that was whether the laws of Georgia had effect in Cherokee country. Here, Justice Marshall in the third trilogy seemed to evidence a change of heart. It seemed that he rethought the discovery rights a bit. The extravagant and absurd idea that the feeble European settlements made on the seacoast, or the companies under whom they were made, acquired legitimate power by them to govern the Indian people, or occupy the lands from sea to sea, did not enter the mind of any man. In this case, Justice Marshall took the opportunity to iterate two separate principles. The first principle involved the inherent sovereignty of the native nations. The court found that native nations indeed were absolutely of nation status. The Cherokee Nation is a distinct community, occupying its own territory with boundaries accurately described in which the laws of Georgia can have no force, and which the citizens of Georgia have no right to enter, but with the assent of the Cherokees themselves, or in conformity with treaties and with acts of Congress. The second principle involved the relationship of the states to the tribes. Justice Marshall found that the states could not interfere 
with the federal tribal relationship. States, as subservient sovereigns in the, United, in the United States constitutional system, had to bow down to the federal government, which exercised exclusive domain in the area of federal Indian law. The whole intercourse between the United States and the Cherokee Nation is, by our Constitution and laws, vested in the government of the United States. So from this trilogy, we have several framework principles, which we'll summarize right now. First, the discovery doctrine, which is still lodged within the United States legal framework, and that doctrine derives from the Catholic Church, basically saying that the European Christian nations had a right to discover inhabited, inhabited continents and exercise supremacy over native peoples. Second, the right of occupancy, meaning that the tribes do have property rights over their lands. They have the right to occupy their lands, but this right does not amount to what we would call full title. Third, the federal plenary power is a federal right to exercise, in effect, dominion over the Indian tribes. Now, this certainly doesn't mean the federal government can interfere with constitutional protections accorded to individuals, but for the tribal federal relationship, the federal government has vast power over the nature of the sovereign relationship between tribes and the government. Fourth, the federal trust responsibility is a unique responsibility held by all federal agencies towards the Indian tribes. It's a responsibility to protect their lands and resources and to secure their interests. Fifth, that tribes have inherent tribal sovereignty. They are, in effect, nations with sovereignty that preceded that of the United States. Six, this sovereignty does not amount to full uh, foreign nation status, but they are properly titled, according to the Supreme Court, domestic dependent nations. And seven, the states must take a backseat position in federal Indian law because of the principle of federal preemption that derives from the supremacy clause. With that framework, let's now look at the periods of federal Indian policy. These periods are very important because they make up the background context to federal Indian law today. And these periods don't break out really as neatly as they are shown on this slide. Um, the eras do overlap, but we will go through the treaty making and reservations, removal, allotment and assimilation, assimilation reorganization, self-determination, and finally, the one we're in now, ecological collapse. So proceeding through these periods, let's begin with the treaty making era. The treaty making era lasted until 1871 when Congress um, finalized or finished um, the use of treaties. After that, there were no more treaties made. Treaties were used to extinguish Indian title, Indian Aboriginal title. And for the Indians, as Charles Wilkinson puts it, it was a Hobson, Hobson's choice. Theoretically, they could keep their land and be overrun by white settlers, or they could sell their land, their ancestral heritage, and remove to a new site. Certainly no happy solution to such a dilemma could be found under the best of circumstances. Well, several principles have emerged from United States case law that interprets treaties. Treaties, foremost, are considered contracts between nations. The Constitution, by declaring treaties already made, as well as those to be made, to be the supreme law of the land, has adopted and sanctioned the previous treaties with the Indian nations and consequently admits their rank among those powers which are capable of making treaties. That's a quote from Worcester v. Georgia, the case we just looked at. In other words, the Supreme Court has held that only nations can make treaties, and so tribes are considered nations with the power to make treaties. Well, looking at the first principle, Treaties are, in effect, both contracts and deeds executed between nations. They are deeds because land was exchanged, and they are contracts because other promises have been made, such as provisions of supplies and education and medical services to reservations. Second, treaties establish the reservations we see today, and they convey the ceded lands to the federal government. In other words, in almost every case, 
a tribe entered into a treaty with the federal government, conveyed lands, which were then called ceded lands, to the federal government, and they reserved lands for themselves that we now call reservations. In the Pacific Northwest and in some other areas, tribes also reserved rights to harvest off the reservation. This is very important as we will see in the Pacific Northwest. We'll be looking at a case study um, throughout this presentation of the Nez Perce tribe, which is a Pacific Northwest tribe located now in Idaho. And we'll see how important fishing is uh, to the Nez Perce people. Those fishing rights were reserved by treaty. Well, next we should know that treaties have the constitutional status as the supreme law of the land. They take precedence over state law in most cases. Treaties are to be construed as the Indians would have understood them. That is a fundamental principle that the Supreme Court has said over and over again with respect to the interpretation of treaty rights. Also important to understand is that treaty rights held by Indian nations today are not rights that the United States government granted to the Indians. They're rights that the Indians reserved to themselves. Nobody granted them the rights. They simply have never been extinguished. So when we talk about treaty harvest rights today, we should think of them in the sense that the Indian tribes simply never gave up the rights to harvest and that they've always been recognized. They are not, as some Americans mistake, special rights that were conveyed to a special people. They were simply reserved by, by people. And finally, treaties endure today. They are not diminished by the passage of time. Well, with that, let's talk about a second era, which was the removal era. Despite the supremacy of treaties, many treaties, in fact, all treaties were broken in the United States to some extent, and many tribes were removed forcibly from their ancestral lands in violation of the treaty. There was an entire era of removal that was characterized by or triggered by the Removal Act of 1830. And this act basically said that it would be the policy of the United States to remove many tribes to other locations to allow Western settlement. One of the most tragic stories of removal involved the Cherokee Nation. Despite that forceful opinion by Justice Marshall that we read parts of confirming the sovereignty of the Cherokee Nation, that was Worcester v. Georgia, and denying authority to the state of Georgia to exert control over the Cherokees, President Jackson removed the Cherokees from their ancestral lands, forcing over 16,000 Cherokees to travel the Trail of Tears, depicted in this slide, to Oklahoma Territory. This was a genocidal journey during bitterly cold winter conditions in which nearly half of the victims died along the way or shortly after arrival. There were other instances of removal as well. Another tragic story of removal involves the Nez Perce tribe of Oregon and now Idaho. The Nez Perce tribe was comprised of several bands, each having their own leader, and each claiming distinct homelands within an aggregate aboriginal territory encompassing about 13 million acres throughout central Idaho, southeastern Washington, and northeastern Oregon. The Wallowa Band of Nez Perce Indians had its ancestral homeland in this beautiful Wallowa Valley of northeastern Oregon. A treaty of 1855 reduced the Nez Perce Aboriginal land base to about 7 million acres, but the Wallowa Valley remained in the band's possession under the leadership of a chief now known as Old Joseph. After gold was discovered in the Nez Perce homeland in the 1860s, however, settlers and miners swarmed in to claim land and resources. In 1863, the federal government sought a new treaty, breaking its old one, ceding more lands, and the government negotiators designated chief lawyer, a, a, a leader who had integrated himself among the whites as the designated agent to cede land on behalf of all the Nez Perce Indians. In Nez Perce governance, however, chief lawyer had no authority to act on behalf of the other bands. But despite this lack of authority, chief lawyer signed a treaty ceding 90% of what remained of the tribal lands including this beautiful Wallowa Valley to the federal government. Only 750,000 acre, acres were retained for the Nez Perce, 
and that remains in Lapway, Idaho, where Chief Lawyer's Band had its home, and where the Nez Perce Reservation and tribal government remains today. Old Joseph, however, and several other leaders refused to sign this 1863 treaty. The Wallowa Band of Nez Perce Indians clung to their homeland despite this 1863 treaty conveying it away. In 1871, just before he died, Old Joseph passed leadership of his band to his son, Hinmatuyelektkekt, which means thunder rolling in the mountains. This man is known as Chief Joseph. The Wallowa Band of Nez Perces, led by this young Chief Joseph, refused to move from its homeland until tensions with white settlers erupted in 1877 and the United States declared war on the small band. Over the course of four months, Chief Joseph led his people, many of whom were women, children, and elders, on a grueling 1,300-mile flight in harsh winter conditions towards Canada, where they sought political refuge. The epic retreat ended just 13 miles south of the Canadian border, where the small band was captured by the U.S. Army. At the Battle of Big Hole, Joseph made his famous surrender speech that included these words. Hear me, my chiefs. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. Well, the Wallowa Band of Nez Perces, numbering only 431 after the war, were held as prisoners and sent to Kansas and then, later, Oklahoma Indian Territory. During exile, a quarter of the band died from malaria, cholera, and malnutrition. Finally, in 1850, 1885, the federal government allowed the 268 remaining Nez Perce prisoners to return to the Pacific Northwest, but not to their homeland in the Wallowa Valley. Chief Joseph and his people were sent to Nespelum on the Colville Indian Reservation in central Washington to join with several bands of Indians from, from that state. Many descendants of the band still live there today, but they have no recognized legal rights to their Wallowa Aboriginal territory, although their spiritual connection with their ancestral homeland is still very strong. The grave of old Joseph lies at the head of Wallowa Lake. In an unsuccessful appeal to gain return of his people's homeland, Chief Joseph made a speech to Congress in 1879. Suppose a white man should come to me and say, Joseph, I like your horses and I want to buy them. I say to him, no, my horses suit me, I will not sell them. Then he goes to my neighbor and says to him, Joseph has some good horses, I want to buy them, but he refuses to sell. My neighbor answers, pay me the money, and I will sell you Joseph's horses. The white man returns to me and says, Joseph, I have bought your horses, and you must let me have them. If we sold our lands to the government, this is the way they were bought. Well, we took some time exploring that case study because it shows many things about Indian policy. It shows how treaties were broken. It also shows how the modern reservations of today may or may not contain the Aboriginal lands of Indian tribes. And we'll be following this Nez Perce case study through modern history as we talk about the modern role of tribes with respect to the federal government. But just remember that the Aboriginal lands of the Wallowa Valley uh, still have sacred connections with the Nez Perce, particularly uh, many in Colville, Washington, and that the seat of the formal tribal government is at Lapway in Idaho. We'll return to this story, as I say, throughout the course. Let's now proceed to the next era of federal Indian law following allotment, uh, or following removal, and that would be the allotment era. The allotment era spanned approximately from 1887 to 1934, and this era is characterized by devastating land loss. In fact, two-thirds of the tribal land base was lost during this era. Here's how it happened. Reservations were broken up into individual parcels, and those parcels were conveyed to individual Indians in fee simple absolute. That would be, you know, regular title. But the problem was the Indian owners often lost those parcels nearly as soon as they gained them because state taxes took effect and the tribal members could not afford to pay those taxes because there was not a system of economic return set up for the tribes. Moreover, 
In addition to losing these individual parcels, they were often sold on county auction blocks, but all of the surplus land was sold, or actually just went, to the federal government. Approximately 90 million acres of allotted land eventually fell into non-Indian ownership through tax foreclosures, subsequent sales on the private market, and other mechanisms. Now, as a result of this allotment, many reservations today are checkerboarded with non-Indian owners. You can see on this slide the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation of South Dakota has much of this checkerboarded ownership. So a reservation today could have tribal lands held in trust by the federal government. It could have individual allotments that are held in trust by the federal government. And it can have private lands that fell into non-Indian ownership in the way I described. The allotment era was devastating to the tribes. And along with the, the allotment era was a push to assimilate the Indians, to Christianize them, and rid them of their cultural tendencies. A great general had said that the only good Indian is a dead one. I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. R. H. Pratt, superintendent of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Schools like the Carlisle School were boarding schools that housed Indian children. An entire generation or more of Indian children were taken from their families and put in these schools where the primary goal was to suppress the Indian culture in them and Christianize the children. Of course, this is a patent violation of all First Amendment civil rights, but it was allowed during that era probably because tribes did not have lawyers vindicating those rights. The next era was the reorganization era, and this represented, if you will, a swing of the pendulum back to emphasize tribal sovereignty. Much of the modern tribal governing structures that we see in federal Indian, in Indian tribes today derives from this era. A Miriam report, the, the so-called Miriam report, which was very influential during um, the time of the Reorganization Act, acknowledged the devastating consequences of allotment. And in 1934, an act was passed that ended allotment and created a structure for tribal government that is familiar to states and the federal government. It also created tribal corporations, and to this day, tribal councils, many of them, not all, but many operate under the structure created through this act of 1934. Tribal corporations are actively involved in business enterprise on most reservations. Well, the pendulum also took another swing back towards the assimilation uh, end of things when the federal government passed a resolution, actually it was the House passing a resolution, that recommended termination of the federal relationship with Indian tribes. Now this resolution needed individual statutes to implement. However, it sent a chilling effect through all of Indian country because tribes were concerned across the board that the federal government would end their specific trust recognition and end support for them. One of the most telling examples of termination involved the Klamath tribe in Oregon. The Klamath tribe had been a very successful tribe. It had ceded, uh, after, after treaty times or during treaty times, it ceded 12 million acres in an 1864 treaty. Um, and secured a reservation of approximately 800,000 acres in South Central Oregon. Its economy was strong. It was managing to do well on its retained reservation. And yet it was targeted during termination in a rather devastating manner. In termination, the federal government converted almost all of the Klamath acreage and sold it off in large blocks um, through a specific act directed to that tribe. As a result, 
the remaining lands of the reservation total only 308.43 acres. The tribe has since regained its federal status, but it has not managed to regain all of the land lost as a result of the broken treaty. The termination era, though it formally affected not, not that many tribes, was devastating to all of Indian country because Indian tribes were suddenly worried about losing their secured property rights, their treaty rights, and everything else that went with it. Well, the pendulum then came back again towards sovereignty with President Nixon, um, who issued a statement of self-determination in 1970. And that ushered in what we call the self-determination era of federal Indian law. There were three principles that really form the essence of this era that still continues today. One is tribal self-determination and autonomy. The tribe should have the freedom to choose their own lives on the reservations. Two, that tribal relationships with the federal government and states are governed by a government-to-government -government principle. In other words, they're not clubs or associations. Tribes are actual native nations, and that their relationship with other jurisdictions should be on a government-to-government -government level. And third, that tribes should take over management of programs that affect them on the reservation. Well, there were many statutes passed that you can see on the right-hand side that were directed towards effectuating these principles. Some concerned education and child welfare. Um, others guaranteed rights of religion. The Indian Self-Determination Act and Tribal Self-Governance Act of 1994, uh, we will come back to that. That gives tribes the ability to um, run and manage governments on their own reservations, and there's actually a sleeper provision that we'll come back to at the end of this session um, in the Tribal Self-Governance Act of 1994 that allows tribes to take over some of the programs on non-Indian lands that used to be Aboriginal lands. The tribes um, are involved in environmental protection on their reservations. There is a special program in many environmental statutes called the TAS program, which stands for Treatment as State. And this means that tribes can develop programs of environmental regulation on their reservations. And then finally, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act provides considerable protection for many of the cultural resources found on federal lands. Well, it would be superficial to just end the uh, list of eras here because we are now entering an era of ecological crisis in this country and throughout the world. And this crisis has enormous effects on native culture and Indian country. Throughout the world, species are collapsing, uh, dead zones in the ocean are growing, there's toxic contamination that affects virtually every tribe in the United States. There's massive air pollution and mining waste. We will talk about how these ecological uh, factors affect tribes and hinder their ability to carry on their life ways. Uh, but we want to mention at this point in the program climate crisis that you see um, mentioned at the bottom of this slide because we are in a period of considerable urgency with respect to climate change. Climate scientists have recently said that the long-term threshold for maintaining a stable climate is about 350 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. We are currently at 383 parts per million. This means that a tremendous threat on the horizon for not just tribes but everybody in the world is climate instability. And we will see throughout the remainder of this course that this instability is having grave consequences for tribes. Alaska Natives, for example, um, Native villages are having to move from the sites they've been at for thousands of years because the permafrost beneath them is melting. Uh, tribes in the Pacific Northwest are experiencing enormous uh, harm to their salmon fisheries because of warming waters. Forests are dying and species are collapsing in various areas. So this in itself is perhaps the new era of federal Indian law that will be a challenge to all federal managers.
At stake is nothing less than the ec ecological integrity of the land base and the physical and social health of Native Americans throughout the continent. Winona LaDuc. Climate change is the canvas on which the history for the 21st century will be painted. Forewarned is forearmed. Mark Linus, Six Degrees. If we continue to do exactly what we are doing, with no growth in the human population or the world economy, the world in the latter part of this century will be unfit to live in. James Gustav Speth, Dean, Yale School of Forestry. Well, we have summarized the major eras of federal Indian law and policy. We've also created a framework of black letter law to guide us through this field of federal Indian law. And next, we will look at the native culture, traditional harvest, and modern threats to native nations. Let's take a brief break. <laughs>